Hey everyone, I'm photographer Joseph J. McAllister, and today we're taking a look at one of my all-time favorite cameras, the 11 by 14 ultra-large format Burke and James commercial view camera. Burke and James Incorporated of Chicago was in the business of manufacturing cameras from 1887 through 1981. Now, it's a little hard to gauge when this camera was manufactured. It could have been uh, 1940s or even early 60s. Okay, so that being said, let's go ahead and find out a little more about this camera. Now on these little view cameras we have a front and a rear aspect. Right now we're going to talk about the rear aspect of the camera which of course is on the back of the camera. Now on the rear aspect of this camera we have what's known as the reducing back which pops off like that. Now this reducing back is for 11 by 14. The reason why it's called a reducing back is because you can actually have smaller sizes. Um, like over there on the table, I have an 8x10 reducing back, and in the shelf, I have 5x7 reducing backs for smaller photos. As you can see, they just pop on like that. You find the lower position, they have little uh, divots right there. And you get that in, and then you clip it in right like that. And they even have little safety latches on the top and bottom to help hold that in place. Now this reducing back is set up at landscape orientation. In other words, it's wider than it is tall, which is good of course for things like landscape photography. Now if you were going to do portrait photography, you'd probably want to flip this around and set it up for portrait orientation. So now it's taller than it is wide. Now, right here, you're gonna notice that we have a ground glass view plate in the center of the reducing back. Now, this is where you're gonna see your image and also where you're gonna focus it. And in order to get the best image, you're probably gonna to wanna to use a magnifying glass. And most of the time, people focus to the eyes because when you look at someone, that's usually where you look. And so your eyes are going to naturally focus on the eyes themselves. And even though you don't notice it, everything in the background will probably be a bit out of focus. Now, these little view plate connectors here, you're going to notice around the view plate, actually hold the view plate in. One thing that's important about these is you don't want to tighten these down as hard as you can because it'll put a lot of pressure on that piece of glass and it's just metal against glass. And the first time you set the camera down too hard, this plate's gonna bust and you're gonna have to buy a new view plate. So with these uh, view plate connectors, just tighten them down enough that the screw doesn't fall out on the ground and just enough that it holds the plate in position. Allow it a little room, not so that it actually wiggles, but so that there's not too much pressure on it. Now right here we have a dark slide. Basically this is a film holder to keep the light away from the film so it doesn't get exposed. And it has a film holder on the front and on the back so that you can actually take two photos with this. Now, this is a very large film holder. This is 11 by 14. And of course there are uh, 8 by 10, 5 by 7, 4 by 5, and other sizes of film holder dark slides. Now, in order to open this up, we're going to slide it open like that. Uh, you'll flip this out Put your film in there, your negative, in a dark room, usually completely pitch dark, and shut it like that, and then put it back together, and make sure 
that little part at the end goes together. Uh, also, these are usually pretty stiff, so you gotta be real careful with them. Now, you can convert these to uh, use with colloidium by removing this end piece. And there's actually a center divider right here, and you pull that out and move it to the back. And then you're all set up to put this back together. And now you can use it for colloidium as well. Now, there's only one correct way to introduce this dark slide into the back of the camera. As you can see, right here is the correct opening. Uh, this side is different and it's got a little blocker right there and obviously you can't put it in there there unless you flip it for portrait orientation. Now these old cameras are a bit of a mechanical wonder in that they have all these different adjustments that you can do to them. Uh, tilt and shift and all these knobs and dials and everything. Uh, in order to get the picture that you're looking for and yet there's no electronics whatsoever. Now one important feature that this camera does have that most view cameras don't have and sometimes it becomes a problem uh, aside from the bellows being red it has this uh, bellows support arm aperture going on here and without it uh, the bellows wouldn't be raised so that it would be straight which is important with the camera that has a full 36 inches of uh, bellows and track. So as you can see, if I adjust that, uh, now the bellows has a sag to it. So when it's fully extended, uh, we're gonna wanna use this bellows support arm. Just like that. Now for a shorter focal length, uh, something that's really important uh, that comes with these older bellows, but newer manufacturers of the bellows uh, don't usually include this. And it actually is really important. You see this sag on a shorter focal length. Um, to get rid of that, we've got a little uh, bellows hook. And we're gonna attach that. And as you can see, the sag has been removed. Now, if you go to focus this um, and you extend the bellows and you forget to remove that, you're gonna end up ripping your bellows. So be very careful with that. Now, why would you want a camera with such a long bellows extension? Well, that actually has to do with the lens and the focal length of the lens. Now, this lens is that it comes with is a compound convertible lens. In other words, it can convert from a portrait lens to a telephoto lens. And how you convert that is by removing the front lens aperture. Now, with this front lens aperture attached, you're actually using both of the lens, the front aspect lens and the rear aspect lens. And obviously that makes it into a portraiture lens. Uh, the thing about that is that the focal length when using both of these lenses is about 12 inches. Now, the second you remove this front aperture lens, it becomes a telephoto lens, which telephoto lenses have a much longer focal length. So now, as marked on the rear aspect, it says 29. And that refers to the focal length will be 29 inches when using this rear aspect alone. So that is why we call this a compound convertible lens. Now this lens is a BTAX number five. And it comes with uh, your standard shutter settings, uh, which has a shutter inside. Um, it's got the shutter arm and it's got time, bulb, and your different meter settings from a, a 50th of a second to a half a second. And your little adjustment for that is right here. You just slide this little arrow back and forth to where you want to use it. Now right here is the screw-in port for a shutter release cable that 
will trigger the shutter um, without wiggling the camera. So it's kind of nice to use that. One thing you'll notice about this as well is that the markings on the front of the lens, F8, so that's a one. Uh, the maximum aperture of this is f1.8 and 11 by 14 uh, tells you the coverage so you know that this is going to work with an 11 by 14 camera and not uh, something like a 5 by 7 which wouldn't provide enough coverage for the entire view plate. Now usually focal length is measured in millimeter like 300, 600 millimeter. Um, because this is a American made lens, it was made in Rochester, New York, um, could possibly be why uh, they're measuring on the rear aspect lens that the focal length is 29 inches instead of like 300 millimeter or whatever that is. I think it's like 714 millimeter. Now down here is where you have your aperture settings from F8 to f64 so up here shutter time and then aperture is how small the hole is like this full thing all the way opened up is f8 as its maximum and you could squeeze that down all the way to uh, f64 Another thing you have to be really careful about is with these cameras, sometimes they have these little hidden adjustments that you just wouldn't realize were there. Now, if you clamp this down, this can lock your focus knobs in place. And if you go to try to focus, you're gonna end up stripping your gears or your focus knobs. Another thing that you might forget to do is to screw in these little uh, track lock knobs. And if you don't do that, this uh, track is going to sag down and it's going to look kind of weird. Uh, it might set off the balance of this whole thing and send it crashing to the ground. Now, these lock knobs are in front and they're in back for the rear track as well. So you want to make sure that these are on firm uh, from the get-go when you get started. Now, on the rear aspect, we've got some standard adjustments. We've got the focus knobs on either side back here. We've got the billows extension arm adjustment right up here on the top to lock this arm in place. And right here we have on either side our tilt uh, up and down for the rear aspect. And we have also a shift up and down adjustment. Now down here we've got our swivel adjustment knobs for the rear aspect, but to access them we're going to have to shift the rear aspect up. So we just unlock this one in the center and we're going to have to unlock the two side ones as well. Now this gives us limited swivel, although it's actually plenty. Um, if you undid these two uh, side locks completely remove them you could go as far as you want but um, I don't really think there's any point in going any further than that and another thing I'm noticing is the rear aspect has a, a focus lock as well and of course you know these things are pretty well hidden but there it is right there and there Now, one of the really important things about buying one of these old view cameras is whether the bellows is in good condition. Uh, first of all, they can be brittle and cracking and they can, um, you know, like as you squeeze and expand them, they're not going to last very long. They're going to start to rip and things. Um, also, what the material is that they're made of. Uh, this bellows appears to be leather. I'm not really sure, but it seems like leather to me. Uh, some of the older bellows were made of leather. Um, now, you can replace these bellows. There's people on eBay that replace them, and they do a good job. I've worked with them before. As long as you send them 
uh, the correct measurements and make sure that you expand the bellows as far as it can and measure that and make sure that you have your full bellows extension. It's kind of a complex process to do that, but uh, they do a very good job and it's not hard to replace these yourself. Uh, you just got um, some of these like this it appears to be glued in, um, but you can rip it loose and then I uh, use little screws and you screw it back in or, or like um, with one of my cameras I use little tack nails and just actually tacked all the way around it and yeah it works pretty good it's it's not hard to do but it's it's a pain it's better if your camera does come with a good intact bellows now this bellows I was lucky with all my camera bellows um, that this camera bellows uh, doesn't have any pinhole leaks and that's really critical and it's important to buy um, your camera from somebody that's not just a reseller but actually an experienced uh, view camera film or colloidian photographer that really knows what they're talking about and can at least tell you the actual state of the camera and all the specs and you know like the focal length of the lens and there's so many people on uh, eBay selling cameras that don't know anything about cameras and they just say as is and at that point you don't really know what you're getting you might have owe another couple hundred bucks for this you might owe uh, another thousand dollars for a lens these lenses are very expensive uh, some of these knobs might be busted and then like these were a lot of these were hand machined they can't be replaced um, you have to take it to a machinist to try to figure out if he can like uh, hand tool some some new piece to put in there and, and fix it again so so it's really important to buy a camera from somebody that knows what they're talking about and can tell you everything about it now also these wooden tripods like such as the one that I have it mounted on right now uh, they they have all kinds of cool adjustments where they can tilt the camera down and they can raise it up and um, they can also move up and down and then the legs can be shorter or longer and all kinds of cool adjustments on that and you can swivel the camera uh, without having to pick the whole thing up and things like that but uh, even like 360 all the way around so it's got all kinds of cool adjustments I'm not going to go into it in this video I've gone into it in previous videos about cameras um, but I will tell you it's really important to have a really good solid tripod and like these old wooden tripods especially for one this big this actually weighs uh, 32.6 pounds something like that um, and so it has to be really sturdy your digital tripods and uh, cameras and things like that um, your digital camcorder and camera tripods are not going to be strong enough to hold this um, they're also like they have this little adjustment on there for where you unscrew it and then it it turns down like that and even if it was a heavy duty one uh, it's going to dump that whole camera on the ground and probably destroy it and your lens as well you'd be out a couple thousand dollars so I wouldn't advise doing that um, you can also get like a studio um, for something this big it'd be good to get like a studio um, tripod which are these big old huge wooden things with like a big gear on the side and everything um, those are really good but you can just use this this is a field tripod that I'm using and you can take it out and you can mount it uh, on the side of a, a mountain or wherever and go ahead and take your picture although I want to try backpacking this thing anywhere because it is 32 pounds um, but you can you could get a good ways away from the car like carrying it you know however far you can take it but um, yeah this was originally designed as um, an outdoor camera and it could be a studio camera it could be an outdoor camera and it could even be one that you take uh, and uh, you know you have a, a Range Rover or something like that or a Jeep and you get way out into the Sierras or some kind of cool landscape 
And you could set up next to your car or maybe like 40, 50 feet from your car, 100 feet, and you'll be fine to use something like this. So, and you know, as far as like film or colloidian, uh, you know, it's it works great as a camera and it's got 11 by 14 or 8 by 10, which for film, uh, usually the easiest thing to come by is like 8 by 10 or 5 by 7. Uh, also, I have used this camera numerous times for colloidian and for film myself and it works great. So it's in good shape and everything works on it, which is really important. And uh, I guess it's ready to go, it's ready to shoot. So um, as far as like the Burks and James camera, I'd say it's a great camera to have in your camera arsenal for us view camera photographers. So until next time, uh, this is Joseph J. McAllister and thanks for tuning in. Like, share, and subscribe.